Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. No. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Kumo Shongwe, and I'm the Africa Leadership Initiative class, or the third class, South Africa. I live in Johannesburg. And I'm going to read the pledge that my fellow Ali fellows, the three of us have drafted together with the support of the Archbishop Thabo Makoba. Those fellows are Neo Muyanga as well as, as Michelle O'Dayan. This is our pledge to create ongoing dialogue series, to have deep, authentic conversations in South Africa, to discuss race and class, so as to improve race relations in the country by the year 2018. That's our pledge. Hello, my name is Claudia Cruz. I am a fellow from the Central American Initiative, um, Leadership Initiative, class uh, five. And my pledge has been to ignite the spark of leadership in young students in El Salvador, especially youth at risk through music um, and instilling leadership values and teamwork, social values. Uh, my new pledge now is always in the same line, but the sense of urgency um, has made me push myself a little more. And I'm, I'm reaching 550 students right now. So my pledge is that by 2016, I'll have reached 1,000 students in El Salvador. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Govind Raj Atiraj. I'm from the uh, India Leadership Initiative uh, First Class. Uh, I'm also a television and print journalist and founder of a data journalism initiative called India Spend uh, and a sister edition called factchecker.in. Uh, it's also a social entrepreneurship uh, venture. My um, pledge is to uh, take this message to the 5,000 most influential people in India. Uh, this pledge was made a little while ago. The target is 2015. Uh, we've achieved about 2,000 almost. Uh, we've got 3,000 more to go. Uh, in the last year, we've uh, managed to reach our message to almost three to four, 300 to 50 to 400 powerful and influential uh, people in India, including in government and media. Our work is now uh, visible on platforms like Dow Jones and Yahoo News and a whole bunch of uh, newspapers and online platforms again, back in India again. My hope is that I'll uh, complete and finish the target of 5,000 most influential people in India so that they can disseminate this information and help uh, uh, take the message of uh, empowering citizens to demand more accountability and transparency. Thank you. We are told we are getting, thank you. We're gonna be performing a, a, a small selection of musical numbers uh, for you, um, all from uh, ancient Chinese folklore. Um, no, I'm just kidding. So before I change my mind, uh, I thought I would open this panel in the tradition of every single panel that I have been at this week uh, by reading you the dictionary definition of disruption. <laughs> since it's a very original thing to do, uh, and since all of you are third graders who apparently don't know English words. Um, afterwards, I will also read to you uh, some other definitions that you might find useful. Uh, the definition for shoe, uh, the definition for hot dog, the definition for palace, and of course, that great opposite of disruption, ruption. <laughs> I then propose uh, an interpretive dance uh, of no longer than 25 minutes to make the concept of disruption come more vividly to life. I think if I share any ambition with my wonderful panelists today, it's that after this panel, uh, you will continue to have no idea what disruption actually means. Um, so thank you, and I'm delighted to introduce this excellent 
panel today. I'm going to start uh, at the very far end with uh, Shamina Singh, who is the executive director of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Uh, whose mission is to advance sustainable and equitable economic growth and financial inclusion around the world. I also asked each of these panelists to give me a kind of more unauthorized six-word biography of themselves. Um, and Shamina's is public and private sector bridge builder. That's pretty good. Um, to Shamina's right is Joe Chen. Uh, who's the founder, chairman, and CEO, which are you know, basically three different jobs, it sounds like, of Ren Ren, a leading real-time SNS, which we hope to learn what that is, online games, and group buying company in China. Uh, to his right is uh, Mark Lundstrom, who just stepped down as the CEO of Bioscale, which he founded, uh, and which has developed some of the world's most sensitive scales for nanotechnology measurement, of protein cells, viral load, uh, hormones, bacteria, as well as, importantly, small molecules. Yeah, small molecules. Um, <laughs> and to his right uh, is, last but not least, Sheila Marcello, who's the founder and CEO of Care.com, which has paired hundreds of thousands of families throughout the US with quality caregivers, uh, including childcare, senior care, pet care, and housekeeping. Um, I, I realize I stopped doing the six words, so let's go back. Joe, explorer, investor, history buff, future predictor. Pretty good. Mark, industrial cliff jumper and inflecting entrepreneur. And Sheila, inventor, disruptor, mother, mentor, friend. Uh, and Sheila presciently has left out the sixth word for future uh, future decision. Uh, so please, if you see Sheila afterward, help her find herself uh, through that six words. So how about a round of applause for this great panel. So I want to begin, the, the theme of this panel, uh, in addition to Chinese folklore, is business innovation and, uh, and disruption in the business world and the worlds that all of you operate in. And I really wanted to focus us uh, as we leave today on both the promise and perils of the future. And you all are, are involved in building the future and in, in trying to think about what it looks like. Um, and really kind of wanted us to think about uh, three things. What is the wild future? that you all see in your different domains? What's the wildest future that maybe the rest of us don't see because we're not in your domains? What are the current problems of the world that this wild future might help us solve? Um, and what are the new problems we expect will be created by the wild future? Um, so let's begin at the beginning. And I want to ask each of you, just starting with Sheila and working down, um, to kind of briefly tell this audience one thing uh, that you expect most people here don't know, that you may have had a glimpse of, um, that, that is part of the future that's coming that you think might transform the world? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Um, you know, when I think about uh, the data, and many of you know, around the trends of senior care, uh, the trends of, of the shortage of women uh, participating in the workplace, and how that can help drive economies, a lot of data is out there. But I think um, some of the things that I think a lot about is the shortage of caregivers um, that's causing this crisis. And when we look at the economic trends uh, as well as population trends, where there are many countries with low birth rates, there's going to be such a dependence on countries with high birth rates to actually support and care for those countries. And so for all the things that we, I know immigration's a hot topic. Um, I was talking to, I think Vincent was in, uh, he and I were in a disruptive medical care session together. And, and the reality is we're not going to really have a choice down the road. Uh, and I actually think um, it's not picking political sides. It's the fact that if we don't have solutions to care for our families, and solutions brought on by disruptive technologies like care.com uh, to find and scale solutions, 
we're really going to run into serious problems. And, and if we look at, just as an example of Japan, probably one of the most isolationist country in the world, the fact that they are thinking about robots for caregiving, they are thinking about opening their, their um, immigration for, for hundreds of years, they were so close to that, but they don't have a choice. What do you think, if you look at this society where we are now, what do you think is the wildest thing that will be common practice 30 years from now that if you told people now it would be common practice, people would say, no way that's going to happen? Well, it's, Robots? It will, well, no. It's actually so, if you think about it, okay? So 15 years ago, when people were looking for jobs, people said we would never go on the internet to go hire. And that's the first place we go to. Dating 10 years ago. God forbid I would find the love of my life online. And how many weddings do we go to now? And when we think about care, and when we think about Uber, or you think about all these marketplaces that are creating what I call meritocracy by, by using disruptive technology, freelancing. I mean, where we're headed is really opening up complete marketplaces for peer-to-peer -peer solutions to make it much more efficient to solve our everyday problems. I mean, that's, that's where it's headed, and so it's gonna be beyond boundaries. We're not gonna have a choice, and what we're doing is actually empowering sole proprietors, 20 million in this country alone already, and we're creating marketplaces that open it up to possibilities. I'm, I'm optimistic, actually, about the future. Yeah. Well, Mark, why don't you follow us? What, uh, specific wild things that are gonna astonish people in this sure. room. So I hope that in 10 or 20 years, the word cancer will switch from being a noun to a verb. So instead of having cancer, the patient would be cancering. Um, and it's, it becomes a manageable thing instead of a, a death sentence. And, um, and let me back up now and, and sort of go through some steps, I think, from where we are now and, and how we get there. Um, so most people, I think, uh, are well familiar with, uh, with genomics, of course. Genomics, incredible science that's uh, really exploded in the last 10 years, especially. Uh, incredible uh, amount of information talking about the predisposition of diseases and matching drugs to patients uh, probabilistically. Um, but what's going to happen next, I think, for the next 10 years, in order to be able to start to manage disease states more effectively, is there'll be a new bow wave of, of interest. And after genomics, I think the world will start to uh, look more at proteomics and start to look at the measurement and the management of, of proteins uh, in order to manage disease. So if you, if you think about, um, so again, the genomics, genomics will tell you what might happen to you. Proteins generally tell you what is happening to you. It's much, much more difficult to measure, but if you can, then you can actually pick up diseases much, you can, you can identify a disease much earlier, and then you can also do very important things for the management of disease. So for example, uh, a lot of times people would develop resistance to drugs, and you can, you can measure that, you can, you can manage that if you can measure proteins more effectively. Um, you can also determine uh, what dosage levels to have. And so as a net result of this, I hope that over the next 10 or 20 years, what will happen is instead of, um, instead of people uh, uh, receiving a, you know, what, what oftentimes is indeed a death sentence, um, it, it becomes something which is more manageable, like, like, a, like, like diabetes is today, for example. So we have robots uh, massaging our aging parents. Uh, we have cancer becoming a verb. Joe, how are you gonna, are you gonna one up this? The wild future. Well, these are the two important uh, areas that I think will have a uh, major impact in the future. But I think that I want to bring a historical perspective. I think in order to predict future, you have to look at past, particularly to technology uh, revolution. So I past two days, I managed to uh, you know, study a little bit about the industry revolution, uh, which most of you probably know. But not that many of you probably doesn't know um, the second industry revolution, which happened in the second uh, half of uh, 19th century all the way to the First World War, where uh, in the first stage of revolution, the, the, the technology advancement focused on the uh, improvement and invention of steam engine and iron making, uh, as well as uh, textile industries. But in the second phase of industrial revolution, actually, uh, the key word there is synergy. So the basic idea was already laid out there, but then in the second phase, you had the emergence of new industries such as steel making, such as um, you know, infrastructures like skyscrapers and the steel, steel bridges. You have uh, new industries such as the chemical industry that, that, that's apparently not directly related to a steam engine, but nevertheless enjoyed a lot of synergies created by the simultaneous improvement 
of productivity in multiple industries, lowering costs of core materials and technologies. So I see a very striking par uh, parallel of the IT revolution, which started about 70 years ago uh, from a single silicon chip. And what drives the revolution was really the, the Moore's law, right? The observation, or you can say, that, that the density of the transistor uh, is gonna double every two years. But we all know that Moore's law now is sort of slowing down. Instead of doubling every two years, now we're seeing three years or even four years because we're really reaching that limit. So this is, so we're looking for new ways to grow technology and I clearly see that the synergy as the defining uh, characteristic for, for technology development going forward because if you take a robot, right, nothing of the robot is brand new. You basically have a computer chip sitting with a bunch of mechanical devices. It's really about how low can, can you drive the cost down so that it becomes available for everybody. And what's something that specific, one specific thing that you think will be, again, commonplace when we gather here again 30 years from now that would be astonishing to people now? Just like, I think just like this first industry revolution sort of liberated people from a lot of the physical labor, right? I think the IT revolution sort of is working really hard to alleviate some of the mundane uh, intellectual tasks. Uh, I think for the next few decades, we might be astonished by the fact that um, some of the very difficult problems everybody here trying to solve might be easily solved by robots. Then the fundamental astonishment is that what do we do as a human race? But the robots are also going to be busy massaging the old people, so you have to, you have to allocate our robots very carefully. Um, Shamina, you think a lot about the world of money. Um, and you know, for those of us who are in Aspen and don't know a lot about money, um, <laughs> help us think about what's the wild future of something seemingly, seemingly quite stable like money. Yeah. Um, I think the future of money is actually going to be the future without money. That's the big, that's the big prediction. That's good news for writers. <laughs> <laughs> or at least money as we know it. Okay. So I think the future of money is going to be about breaking down uh, barriers to access uh, and increasing more people in, uh, by geography, regardless of income, in the formal financial system. So, and, and this is true because the technology and the payment systems that we've all talked a little bit about up here reduces the friction between um, making, tr making uh, buying and selling goods. And that friction is cash. So when I talk about the future of money and the future money, the future being without money, I mean cash will be gone. I can even say less than 30 years you're not going to see cash. Um, because, again, with the tech, with the tech advances, uh, how you pay for money actually becomes a driver of equality of opportunity. So we're great here because we live in a place probably where we have access to uh, digital payment solutions. So whether it's uh, paying on the internet or, or using a credit card or using a debit card, 85% um, of the world's transactions are conducted in cash. And so when you conduct transactions in cash, you're much more susceptible, if you're living in an informal economy, to crime, corruption, violence. You don't have the, uh, the protections that come with having something like a bank account. Think about that for a second. 2.5 billion people in the world, half of the adult population, operates in an economy that does not have access to formal financial systems. They operate in a cash economy. So the next time you're thinking about how easy it is for you to go online and book your travel to Aspen, or how easy it is to save your money and have a savings account and a checking account and a this kind of account, think about the, the women in India and the women in Rwanda who are getting most of their money through social subsidies from their governments. And what we know right now is that by the time the government leaves, sends out a social subsidy, because they're operating in a cash economy, 40% of the subsidy disappears by the time it gets to the actual recipient. Because of all the middlemen, of all the little pieces of rupees or pesos or whatever that gets taken out. So Anand, my 
My prediction, and I actually don't even think it's a prediction, I actually think it's a reality It's happening a lot faster, is that the future of money is going to be a future without money. Mm. So now let's, let's shift gears. You've all sort of gotten into this already, but thinking about current problems that this, that this future you're all working on might solve. Mark, you, Bioscale was involved in nanotechnology, this cracking the world of the very, very, very small. Um, can you tell me what kinds of things, what kinds of possibilities, solutions start to open up once you're able to get into the world of the very small? How does it change war? How does it change, you already talked a little about medicine, how does it change all variety of fields once we're able to work at that much smaller level? Yeah, well if you, if you just take, um, if you just stay within the guardrails of biology for a second and think how it impacts other parts of society besides just medicine, um, you know, first of all, there's going to be new techniques, new, um, new tools will be able to be more effective for food safety. There'll be a battlefield diagnostics that can happen so that when a soldier goes down, you can on the spot uh, diagnose them for um, uh, if they're having traumatic head injury, for example. Um, there's certain biomarkers. When, uh, when, a, when, when traumatic head, in, head injury happens, there's certain biomarkers that are thrown off. And if you can measure those quickly, then you know what type of situation so you that you're dealing with. you inject something into someone? No, no. You, uh, you take a sample of their blood. And in the blood, there's about 100,000 different proteins that are swimming around. And there's a specific protein that's a marker for traumatic uh, brain injury. And if you can measure that marker and you know that the brain injury has happened, then you treat the patient in a certain way on the battlefield, for example. Um, so, um, but, you know, within the world of medicine, it'll be... It'll be uh, uh, fundamental in terms of things like companion diagnostics, being able to miniaturize technologies down so they could actually be in the doctor's office and so that patients can actually have much better care at the bedside. Uh, there's a lot of innovations that nano nanotechnology is going to provide. Yeah. Um, Sheila, I want to go a little bit deeper in this question about flexible work. And a lot of times, one of my, maybe this is a personal irritation, but I, but I don't like the association of flexible work with kind of women and motherhood exclusively, because there's actually a lot of reasons that people have uh, to not want to work the same amount as the two people who live next door to them. Um, can you talk about how this kind of peer-to-peer -peer thing, people being able to kind of sell their labor in a variety of ways, um, what else it might unleash? What other side projects besides motherhood uh, it might unleash in the society? I, I mean, it's already done it, obviously, for Uber and improving transportation. Um, and so there are so many other freelance labor other than caregiving and not specifically associated with, with moms and motherhood. Lots of uh, other professions that I think could, it's already happening in telemedicine when it comes to uh, radiology. There's a lot of in-home sort of uh, professions that are starting, and you're right, it's not just gender specific. Uh, my but why is it, if I, if I, what always surprises me is if I'm a very talented lawyer, which I'm not, um, it's actually very hard for me to sell 15 hours of my mind to the market every week. Why is it so hard in a well, very functional market well, society? I, well, previously, I think that technology was very difficult, um, uh, and, and it was very costly to kind of build that kind of scale. Uh, and now, uh, obviously, with lower costs of, of storing data and the ability to be able to serve up uh, interfaces, mobile, desktop, anywhere in the world to access labor is, 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 is now much more ubiquitous. So I think that that's helped that lowers technology, but it's also what I started to say is so much of it is also consumer mindset and behavior to feel comfortable with the use of technologies because you're putting your profile and your life out there to sell your wares, which is the services that you provide. You to become a brand. Right, and you're creating a brand. LinkedIn's doing a good job when they purchase Pulse, and it's now moved from just ego, how many links, to now, what do I stand for, and creating your own personal brand. I think they've done a great job of even moving that forward, even more uh, prevalent for professionals than blogging. I think with, with, what, with what they did on sort of the homepage. My key concern, I know that was sort of your latter question, is. So much investment is made in you know, removing the middlemen, creating peer-to-peer, -peer, great, great opportunities. But it also results, I think, in um, loneliness, a lack of community. And this isn't just freelance moms working from home. It's something that I think we have to think about human interaction. I mean, There's no water think, cooler in, this, in yeah, this world. It's, it's important. And I think you know, Marissa Mayer, Mayer got so, so, such criticism around trying to bring people back, but yet there's debate around remote and creating culture. 
and, and creating a sense of belonging for people. And, and, and we need to think about that with technology. At the same time, I think that robots is another a topic that comes, or, comes up in terms of... I'm shocked to hear the, more about the, robots. The, no, but no, it's both something around the risk of, of human interaction. We think of our own children and how much they text. And we think about how, why do we have rules during the week of no computers and not texting because we encourage face-to-face -face human interaction that we would like the next generation to actually value. And so you can imagine 20 or 30 years from now, what are sort of our rules of engagement when we have such this incredible peer-to-peer -peer network and this disperse, you know, remote employee base? I mean, that's where it's headed. I mean, the rise of freelancing compared to corporate jobs, it's where it's headed. Yeah. But how do you create systems in which human interaction is still critical and important? It's the same questions that we think and grapple with of going global, creating great access, but yet we prioritize local. We prioritize local farm and the organic, and why does community mean a lot to us? Yeah. So those are the kinds That's of things at least I think about and how you can still use the disruptive technology for virtual water cooler. Yeah. Um, Joe, uh, you know, there are some people, perhaps even in this room, who don't think the lack of freedom in China is a problem. But let's stipulate um, that it is a problem. Do you think the Chinese aspiration to be innovative, to build innovative companies, to be an innovative superpower, perhaps, will collide with the lack of freedom and perhaps change it? So I think that if you really think about disruption for the future, I think it's really not particular industry, but the way that we disrupt probably become dramatically different. This probably refers to how, referring to question how countries compete and how companies compete, right? So the, the pattern I see how companies are now competing is not purely by invention, but, but by, you know, burning wood, because it, the second, second phase of the industry revolution is really an area of a synergy. So I think if we are in the second phase of IT revolution, there's really about creating a synergy. Uh, you know, you have great leaderships, which, which are great synthesizers, being able to bring different aspects of the business and, and the part of the business that's disrupted by technology, and you ride on that rather than defending against yourself. But going back to your question, how countries compete, I think that uh, it's related to your questions. I've been thinking about this, right? Because in agriculture, society, uh, what, is the, what is the scariest resource? It's land. So back in a few thousand years ago, when people, f when people go into war, it's, it's capturing land. And you go into, you go into industry revolution, um, you know, back in 17th century, 18th century, it's all about, uh, you know, hydrocarbon, right? Capturing more energy uh, and more raw materials, turning it into products. So what is really the scarce resource for the second phase of IT revolution. I don't think it's land. I don't think it's energy entirely. I actually think it's human capital. You need, before we invented, before we invent robots that are smarter than us, we need really, really good talents to create them in the first place. So of course, we have to worry about so how to- brains, do ideas and brains. Ideas and brains. So, I think, the, I think there will be a war in the future. I mean, as we discussed like yesterday or the day before yesterday about the striking similarity of, you know, 19, 1914 and 2014. A strike, you have globalization, you have, you're in the middle of a major technology revolution, but are there gonna be a war? My answer, yes. But, there but, will be, but, but it's a different type of war. It's but, a war for talent, not a war for energy. But, but because I have not forgotten my question, is there, yes. <laughs> is there a tension between that desire to be a country of ideas and brains and the lack of freedom? Well, you look at U.S., right? U.S. benefit a lot from, you know, creating, uh, you know, uh, utopian for a lot of the smartest people in the world. They're coming to this country trying to build the American dream. So I think that's, that's why the U.S. has been winning that war. The, in, the, in, the, in the IT revolution or in the future, right? Because Elon Musk is, is uh, he was an immigrant. I'm an immigrant too. So I think that right now, uh, there are two ways to motivate really smart people, entrepreneurial people. One is, of course, economic return. Uh, China, for the past three years, ever since, ever since the, the open door policy and, and modernization, I think successfully did that. We, I was attracted 
by the opportunity that went back to China to participate in the internet. Right? I think the other is, um, is lifestyle issues, such as you know, quality of air. I mean, I, there's a lot of my colleagues and my, my you know, uh, people I know are moving their family back to states because air is simply becoming unbearable in Beijing. Not good for the brain. Not good for brain development and for the kids as well, right? So I think there's multiple issues for the countries to, to every country to consider. But what, it sounds like freedom of thought and assembly and, are, are not things you worry about. Well, for my business, we're not prohibited. We are, you know, we are allowed to compete. Actually, China Internet is one of the most competitive industry. I think competition really drive, drive that industry going forward. That's why, you know, in a few months, within a few months, you're going to have the, the biggest IPO in human history. Alibaba is going to raise $15 billion. Yeah. And so, so that's, I think that says a lot about, about the nature of that business. But I, I, think that, uh, I think the war for talent is definitely going to be equivalent of a war for hydrocarbons. Going forward. Shamina, I wanted to ask you about banks and bankers, um, since there are none of them here, and um, we're speaking in privacy. Um, <laughs> there was a, I, I remember I, I, I met a great central banker, um, who, former central banker, who said, diagnose the entire global financial crisis very simply. He said, you know, for hundreds of years, banks understood that their purpose was to stand behind the people they financed and be means, not ends. Allow other people to do great things, and the banks helped you do those things. They were service providers to people who were doing things in the world. And at some point, banks forgot that, and they started to think of themselves as ends in themselves. Um, do you see that changing now as we kind of unwind from this crisis? And how do financial institutions think of the people they serve today, and how do you think it needs to change? So I'm going to take a page, I think, from Joe's book, and talk a little bit about financial inclusion. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> just missed your question. <laughs> but, I did, but actually, as part of that, I'm just kidding, Joe, sorry. You've totally answered the question. Um, what I was going to, what, what I, 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 listen, I can give you my best, my best thinking on that, which I can promise you is, 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 is not going to be anything hugely philosophical, but I do want to put it in the context of um, the fact that MasterCard actually isn't a bank, and right. it's not a credit card company. So for all of you out there that think MasterCard is a credit card or a bank, it's not. It's the technology that connects a buyer with a seller with their banks. And it's sort of this distributed trust model, which I think is actually a very interesting topic that I've been thinking a lot about. But in terms of the banking, I did work at Citibank for um, five years, and I worked there during the financial crisis. And um, to the extent that I think it was a failure of a lot of things, including the regulatory environment and to, including the political environment. So it was a failure on the government and the private sector side, the banking side. Has there been a shift in the last five years in terms of culture, mentality? And Anand, I can't answer that. I mean, I think that um, it's what we're starting to see are, in the, at least in the United States, is we're starting to see the fines and the penalties. So you're starting to see multi-billion dollar fines hit banks, you know, like J.P. Morgan and Citi and things like that. So I think the story is still being written, quite frankly. In the companies you interface with, do you see people's self-image changing of what a financier is for, what a financier does, what story they tell their children about what their purpose is? I think, uh, I don't think it's by industry, right? So I think I haven't noticed anything different between how a financier might talk to their children versus a politician might talk to their children. And I'm, maybe that's two wrongs don't make a right, but it's sort of like, I guess, the teacher. I mean, it's sort of like in personal interaction, as one of our readings would say, who am I to judge? Yeah. I, can, I, can I say Absolutely. something? You know, I, we just took the company public in January, and I've gotten pretty, uh, I developed a close relationship with um, our book runners and our lead bankers. And I've had these conversations with them. And, and in fact, I, I found that there is a desire actually to be part of the Aspen Institute. And I've, I've spoken to Peter about this. To, th there's a, there's a, a, a willingness to, to really uh, do some self-reflection. Um, and I, I was not, you know, I only took the company public. That's why I want to provide that caveat. I don't know, and I was not interfacing with this team um, that, that took us public 10 years ago. But the sense I get is there's a sense of, 
of, of humility and a sense of a real understanding. And it's also because they're serving clients that are, that are more purposeful and are social entrepreneurs and, and that's actually really inspiring them as well. So that's been sort of part of our conversation. So I, I just have this optimism of getting more of them and be part of the fellowship program to really understand what leadership is about that can make a meaningful difference in that industry. Well, there's so much more I can ask you, but I don't want to steal the opportunity of others. So do you have questions for this great group? Very good questions. There's one in the back that I can't see, but others can't. There we go. Good afternoon. My name is Femi. Um, I wanted to ask um, whether, in fact, the, the incidence of crime and fraud um, won't just shift online. Because one of the points you made, I think, was that, look, OK, you're safer from sort of attacks by when you carry physical cash. But by it going online, isn't there a different kind of fraud um, that uh, one becomes vulnerable to, which um, I think society has to pay attention to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, fraud, like crime, will find its lowest point. So there, there are more people thinking about how to bust open a system than to save a system, quite frankly. So <laughs> you're absolutely right in thinking that um, there will always be crime, there will always be fraud. Um, and I think that's why there will always be a need for safety and security and soundness and the technology to make sure that whatever systems we're moving to are uh, less able to be broken into. And so just a quick example. Um, does anybody remember those, um, the steering wheel on the car? You'd put that thing on the steering wheel of your car to, so that if somebody broke into your car, they couldn't, right? So that didn't really do jack in terms of like, you know, saving your car. But what it did was it made the robber look at your car and say, I'm not going to even mess with it. They've got this thing on the car. I'm going to go to Joe's car and take all of Don't his try. money. Yeah. So I think that that's sort of a, a very simple analogy to what you're talking about, that we have to make things less vulnerable and more secure, but absolutely, there will always be crime. Time for two more questions. Rebecca. Just wondering, um, uh, stemming back to the Aspen Institute and programs that you've been involved with, how did the how did uh, the Aspen Institute or did it affect any of the choices you made along the way in your decisions or your career paths? Yeah. I guess you know, from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm so I'm Henry Crown Fellow class of uh, seventeen, um, and so halfway through the program right now, and definitely as a result, I think of last year's session, the first session started to make some career decisions, you know, realizing I'd been running the same company for probably too long and time to move on and use sort of entrepreneurial skills doing something else. And then also to start to reflect about, you know, what else needs to be done in, in, in the broader system or the broader society and how could, how could one or many contribute to that. And, and, you know, personally I've been very inspired about the project idea and the specific project that, that I've started to take on. It's been, it's been refreshing. You know, it's one of those things that helps you get, get up in the morning, frankly. Anyone else want to take that on or should we take another? Well, Rebecca, I mean, I would say that um, I have, in many ways, I can't even describe the, the ways that the Aspen community are being involved with the Crown Fellowship and the global seminars and having mentors like, you know, Keith and, and everybody else, how that's transformed me. But I will say that, so all of that is absolutely real and critical to my growth, I guess, as a, as a professional, my growth as a human in, in this world. Um, but I've had, as many of you all know, very um, uh, ups and downs in my career and things like that. And I have consistently looked to my Crown Fellows mm. and my Aspen colleagues for guidance, very practical advice and guidance, but also um, confidence and strength and have never been left wanting. So it's been a very um, personal experience, but also very professionally rewarding. Last question. Very important. <laughs> Ana Lopez. To going back to the, the um, issue with um, cash being gone, I'm a little bit concerned how we are going to be prepared um, to handle all or help the people in rural areas who will not have access to the technology to do their transactions. 
It's a great question, and it's actually the, the your country and countries like Kenya and Egypt are actually leapfrogging countries like Europe and the United States around their ability to get rid of cash faster than anybody else. So if you look at somebody, if you look at somebody like M-Pesa in Kenya, where the vast majority of transactions are taking place phone to phone, completely electronic, that's happening and it came about in Kenya. So when you think about rural economies and things like that, governments are moving towards cashless policies and financial inclusion strategies. And as they move to those, those policies, they are also working with private sector companies to build out the infrastructure and the technology that will allow um, people to transact. But the truth is, if you have a cell phone, and most people do nowadays, you can transact. So I have two uh, tasks remaining uh, before I get to go home. The first is to invite you to thank this wonderful panel uh, for their insights. Thank you, guys. The second is a little more complicated. Um, can I have four volunteers, actually let's do six volunteers, people with, who consider themselves to have a sense of rhythm, very good clappers. I know who you are from last night, so I will start <laughs> cold calling you if you don't come up. I want six people to come on stage. Stephen DeBerry, I'm looking, just come on up, the first six. <laughs> Stephen. Good pick. Yeah. Good pick. <laughs> she can dance. We need gender balance. We're done with girls. We need two more men now. Three and three. Please stand, stand right here at the, the edge of the white. Center yourself. It's now a great, it's a great, um, pleasure now to close this panel by calling up Alan Paul, a great musician who you may have heard last night. This is going to be his backup clap slash perhaps dancing troupe. <laughs> As he leads us in a song, a recently composed song yeah. about disruption. And I, I need to say this is all Anand's child, so all uh, laurels and or tomatoes should be thrown his direction. I'm just the, the sucker who says, oh yeah, sure. Okay, so this song uh, has some very simple lines and then has a, a repeating chorus. The chorus is so simple because it's just one word repeated. The word, of course, is disrupt. So uh, my chorus here is gonna help me set the rhythm. Well, I'm gonna clap in a second, then you're all gonna clap and you're all gonna join in. And after I sing the one line, I'm gonna go like this and everyone has to say, Disrupt, disrupt. And you'll be setting the tempo, okay? So let's see. This is a song that's written uh, actually as sort of a poem. There's no vocal melody, so we're gonna have to make that up. So we're gonna get the tempo going, something like this. That's it. El Salvador, America, and India are corrupt. Disrupt, disrupt. Life in New York may well be abrupt. Disrupt, disrupt. What must, we, what must we do once our coffee is cupped? Disrupt! Disrupt! Do it before breakfast and after you've supped. Disrupt! Disrupt! That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh my goodness, so how do we follow that act? <laughs> Sheila, Mark, Joe, Shamina, thank you so much. Anand, thank you so much. Um, uh, some of you may have, no, some, of, some who know me well know that uh, last year Anand said to me, hey Peter, you know, your hair's getting kind of whiter and you're starting to dress very monochromatically. 
And so, much to my wife's amusement, I started going out buying green pants and red pants and paisley shirts. But I've defaulted to mode today, but I'm so glad I didn't dress up uh, any differently than I usually do because, Anand, when you walked on stage, Skip Battle, who is somewhere, I think, in the back of the room, leaned over and said, he looks like he's about to sell beachfront property in Belize. <laughs> So, uh, thank you to the panel for a look into uh, disruption in the future. Thank you for our musical talent for the closing. Uh, I want to thank especially Govin, Claudia, and uh, Kumo for your pledges. Our hope, as you know, at this the 2014 Action Forum and at all of our Action Forums, is that we all walk away with here with a pledge of some sort. Some of you have already put them up on the walls outside. Some of you gave us your pledges when, when you registered. Think about it. It's never too late. If you're leaving here, you want to add your pledge, please do it. But we're going to follow up with you afterwards, not to harass you. But we do hope, we do hope that you have left here thinking about what it is uh, you might do. Uh, I have a few things I want to say, but um, a couple things I want to say before I do. So first of all, again, I want to thank all of our sponsors for this event. We wouldn't be here without uh, the support of Lyndon Stort Resnick. I want to thank the Skoll Foundation for their partnership. I want to thank our friends at Accenture who are here very much on a what I think they would describe as a trial basis to see about this partnership. I need to thank all and I want to thank all of our moderators and lead discussants. You all have been fabulous and without you we couldn't have done what we've done. So thank you. <laughs> There is a huge amount of work, as you can imagine, that goes into this. I've actually had a couple requests just in the last hour, you know, could we do this event um, in one of the countries where our fellows are drawn from? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, we probably have some 30 people working with us on this event here and, and looking at the campus and having all the facilities. It's difficult. It's something we want to think about, but there's a virtual army of people who've helped us to put this together. And so first and foremost, I want to thank the Aspen Global Leadership Network team for all the work that's going on. And I'd like to ask them to come up here if we can. Caitlin. <laughs> Where's Dancy? Where's Martha? Come on, where's, where's Janice? Where's Sydney? Come on all up here. Thank you so much. Take a bow. Where's Martha? Where's Janice? Where's Janice? Abigail. A super, super special thanks to, to Tom Loper and to Sydney. <laughs> Sydney, come up here. <laughs> this is very much a team effort. This is very much a team effort, but these two people right here have been working on this event since August 2nd, 2013, and guess what we're doing tomorrow morning. So. <laughs> thank sure. you so much. Thank you. Where is Janice? Janice, we didn't get to thank you last year. I want to make sure we do it. Is she down in the war room? She went to her room. She went to her room. She's had enough already. Great. Well, thanks so much. So I want to thank the Aspen Institute. Thank you, guys. I want to thank the Aspen Institute's communication team, Jim Spiegelman and his team. Do we have folks here? I'm sure we do. I want to thank everybody from our. Uh, uh, let's see, all on the Aspen Institute, the Aspen Meadows Resort staff, everybody, and a lot of effort has gone into this. Thank you so much for that as well. And I need to ask the audience for one more thing, which is um, to join me in thanking my wife, who allows me to do what I do, this Denise Burnt. So look, I, I don't know about you, but when I left the Henry Crown Fellowship Program, as I left every seminar, I left with a pad that had question upon question for myself that I knew that I didn't have the time during the seminar itself to actually ask myself, but I knew I needed to spend time alone, perhaps on a Jean Monnet type walk, 
asking myself some questions, perhaps in conversation with Denise, asking questions, perhaps in conversation with my fellow fellows asking questions. I certainly leave this event both energized and inspired by you all, but I have a few questions. You know, wh what is my tennis ball? Am I on the right chase? Am I running in the wrong direction? I want to do some thinking about that. How much am I ready to sacrifice for my goals? Um, what more do I want to do? How much more can I afford to do? Can I really help to bend the arc of history? And then can I afford not to try? And these are the sorts of things I walk away with thinking about, prompted very much by our discussions here in the readings. Um, I hope that each of you leaves here with questions as well. I also hope that you leave here with a, a deeper understanding of, of who we are. Michelle Kidley, are you still in the room here? There you are, right there. You know, um, often when I need advice, I'll turn to fellow fellows or I'll turn to uh, Skip as my mentor, or to Keith, or to others. Um, but Michelle and I had a conversation, it might have been just after this event last year. And what she said to me was, she said, Peter, what, what you and your partners are building will only be a success when people don't just say that we're part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. It'll only be a success when they say, we are the Aspen Global Leadership Network. And I think that's true. We are the network, and there, the 320 or so of us who are here this week are but a subset of the whole. I had a number of people come up to me and say, Peter, what an incredible group of people you pulled together, and I said, guess what? We only have 10% of this global network here with us for these few days. I hope you all understand that. My hope in putting this event together and the hope that my team has, and I think that all of us as partners, have in this is that everybody understands that we have something much, much bigger than ourselves. And hopefully in these few days, you've gotten a sense that it's easy for us and the natural thing for us to do is to reach out to our fellow fellows from our own class. But across our own fellowships, we have incredible resources and across the various fellowships around the world, wherever they may be, we have incredible um, um, assistance, support, uh, empathy and an ability to help. You know we have tools to help you reach out. It's a hard thing to do. It's not a natural thing to do. But is Tarek still in the room, Tarek Maya? He may have taken off. Tarek is one of our fellows from Palestine. But he has, you all know that we've had for years an app. And that app went down about six months ago as we upgraded it. It was Tarek and his team in Palestine who helped us to upgrade it. It's going to be up again, Caitlin, when? In one? One week, I saw the one, I wasn't sure if that was one year, one, one week, it'll be up again. Um, really, take the time to explore, to see who else is in this network. Um, it's incredible when you start looking into it. And I want to point out that, that I'm just talking about the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Obviously, we've had our friends here from the Central Valley, and I'd like to thank you all for having been here and offer you a great round of applause as well for being with us. We've had our friends here from this Goal Global Social Entrepreneurs Network who are here as well, and a great round of applause to you. And as I said, we've had fellows from, from Echoing Green, we've had fellows from the Aspen First Movers Program, lots of from the Aspen partners across Europe and around the world, that you too are part of this movement. And I, I think we should all understand that there are a lot of people who are with us both physically and in spirit. So we've built the platform, but as Robert Redford asked of the Aspen Institute itself some dozen years ago, okay, I see you've built a nice stage, but what's the play? Well, I think we need to think about it. I think as Stace's graphic that uh, he put up on the, on the screen showed us yesterday, uh, and as we've seen in places, he showed us that graphic in Honduras. You're a member of the Seven Fellows, and to look at who they were when they came into the fellowship and who they are now, including the President of the Republic. It was a pretty powerful thing. But what I love is when I look around the world, whether it's in Panama or in South Carolina, we're seeing those same sorts of movement. Hain and Anna Cater here, you've seated the state legislature of, of South Carolina. You've seated the courts of South Carolina. You've seated the congressional delegations of South Carolina. Uh, you have people running some of the major businesses in the state. It is remarkable. I think you would agree to watch over these past 
12 years now of the uh, Liberty Fellowship, where the fellows have moved into. Well, the fun thing about this network is looking around the globe, all of us, it's amazing to see where we're ending up. And I think the, the future is going to be even more powerful than we've seen. So I think we've seen that the individual stars that make up this thing that we're building are beautiful in and of themselves. But I think we also see that we're coming together into what is a, an incredible constellation, a constellation that I think embraces the entire world. So let's, let's disrupt and let's chase away the darkness by lighting up the night. Thanks to you all. See you next year.